from my perspective and from your perspective, we know they're culturally important. Billions of people around the world, half a billion to be exact, rely on reefs for food, income and protection, livelihood protection. We also use them for tourism, recreation. They have, as you know, they store many, many species, thousands and millions of species. Some are unknown. environment and nature has a huge impact on our mental health and physical well-being and similarly we impact the environment around us. We now know from scientific research that people in hospital recover 30% faster if they're recovering in a room with a window that looks out on nature so they can see birds or trees or a park. We also know people are 25% more productive in workspaces exposed to natural light. I work in a university, so I always try and make sure that my students have a work environment where they have a window, where they can look out on nature. Imagine what that means for your businesses or your work environment or your children. 25% more productive with natural light. I also know that over the past two years, Many of us have been living with COVID. And this means for a vast periods of time, we have basically had to, you know, stay at home, do the right thing. If we've got COVID, we've possibly isolated in a room. And in Australia, we went many months at a time without actually even being able to leave the house apart from maybe an hour at a time when we were allowed to do uh, shopping and that was it. And I know that I was one of the fortunate few who actually had a garden. And oh my goodness, my garden and nature became so much more important to me during these COVID years. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this. Some time outdoors helped you to feel better in yourself, helped you to feel happier. So having worked in conservation settings for over two decades, I'm repeatedly interacting with scientists, conservationists, managers, government people and politicians. And it's really interesting because people used to say to me, but look, we have to do, make some environmental sacrifices to you know, further development, feed people, further the economy. I'm not anti-development, I'm smart development. So what is our wildlife actually worth? The WWF in 2015 produced a report that clearly stated that tourism in the world's protected areas is a $650 billion industry. It's in its infancy and growing. That's incredible. That tells us people want to be in nature. People want to see our wildlife. And not only is it important to the planet and to our mindset, that also has an economic value. In India, it's been indicated that every rupee invested in habitat conservation returns an estimated 67 rupees. That is a huge return on your investment. Conservation can reap economic rewards. The TOFT Tigers calculated in 2010 that a single tigress in in Rathambore generated an astonishing $101 million for the local economy in visitor fees and other expenditure over the decade of her rule. We have to start being smart and realizing that the environment actually can generate money for us too. We don't need to destroy it. So I'm a marine biologist. Why are coral reefs important? Well, from my perspective and from your perspective, we know they're culturally important. Billions of people around the world, 
half a billion to be exact, rely on reefs for food, income and protection, livelihood protection. We also use them for tourism and recreation. They have, as you know, they store many, many species, thousands and millions of species, some are unknown, and some have potential uses that we're yet to discover. For example, the chemicals in sponges are being used by medical companies to develop medicines for us. We also know that they're really important for shoreline protection. In an era of climate change, when we can expect to see more storms, more hurricanes, more cyclones, so we're getting more high energy events impacting our shorelines. We now know that coral reefs can dissipate up to 97% of wave energy. And normally behind a coral reef, you would expect to see a seagrass bed and behind that, a mangrove. All of these different ecosystems act to stabilize the sediment, protect our shorelines and protect the communities that live along our shorelines. The reality is, we can't replace these natural services. We need to protect them and they will protect us. So what are coral reefs in the Indian Ocean worth? It's an estimated US 2 billion annually and growing. We know of this, tourism represents 70% and income generated from fisheries is the remainder. A value hasn't yet been put on coastal protection from coral reefs in the Indian Ocean. We actually don't know how to put a value on it. However, we could not replace that level of coastal protection by man-made structures. It's just not possible if you think about the vast area covered by reefs in the Indian Ocean. I'm in Australia today, so I thought I'd also highlight what the Great Barrier Reef is worth. The Great Barrier Reef is in the northeastern corner of Australia. It's the world's largest coral reef. You can see it from space. Australia is a country made up of 26 million people, and it generates an estimated $6.4 billion annually to the national economy and supports 64,000 jobs. If we lose the Great Barrier Reef, we lose future sustainable income and jobs for our future children and their children's children. So, climate change. How is climate change impacting our reefs today? Well, as I'm sure many of you are now aware, with climate change, we get ex more extreme environmental conditions. The more extreme events happen more frequently and the magnitude of them is greater. So with warming oceans, what we see is the warm water drives more intense storms and with it, this brings heavy rainfall. Storms can damage our reefs as they that high energy smashes the reef up because the reef is made up of calcium carbonate and sand is thrown around. But I will also say reefs have developed and evolved with cycles of cyclones and storms and hurricanes. However, what we're doing is if you think a normal reef needs 10 to 20 years in between big events to recover, we're actually shortening the recovery period. So instead of a reef having 10 years between a really heavy, big cyclone or storm. It's five years or two years. So we're not giving our ecosystems time to regenerate. And with extreme climate, we also get more rainfall, more flood events, more water running off the land. When we remove the vegetation, we lose our agricultural soil. We lose a lot of our top layers of nutrients. It runs off into our rivers, pollutes our rivers, runs off into the ocean and smothers our reefs and our fish. So you can see how there are knock-on effects all the way downstream. I'm sure you've all seen graphs like this before. This graph demonstrates how the global sea surface temperature has, has been rising. And every year since 1977, the average annual global sea surface temperature has been above the 20th century average. That's this line in the middle. So if you were born after 1977, you have not witnessed a normal year. This increase in sea surface temperatures closely matches the carbon dioxide curve, the CO2 curve over the same, same period. There's a close correlation. The more carbon dioxide we put into the air, the more it insulates our planet, the warmer our world becomes. So what does this mean for a coral reef? Well, a healthy coral reef 
has a very colorful reef made out of hard corals and they're called hard corals because they have a calcium carbonate skeleton. The same calcium carbonate that we have in our bones and like us they have a skin over the top and it's this skin and the symbiotic algae that live in the skin of corals that give it the color. The algae gives the coral nutrients and food and in return the coral gives the algae a home and also feeds the algae. When a coral gets stressed from heat stress or pollution, the algae leave the coral host, and that's what we call bleaching. The coral goes white. If the water conditions return to normal, the pollution goes or the water temperature returns to normal, the coral can recover. If the coral doesn't recover, what you see is the white bones of the coral shining through its skin, and this is what we call bleaching. And if a coral starves for long enough and bleaches for long enough, it dies. So these are images that I've taken underwater of some of my different coral reef sites. The images on the left are healthy corals in the Indian Ocean. The top middle image is a bleached coral that's still alive. And then the subsequent ones on the right and underneath show you what happens to a coral when it dies. It gets covered in algae, it looks very dead, and the fish associated with it and the other reef organisms leave. So I thought I'd give you a brief insight to some of the science I've been doing. So this bottom left picture is a coral core taken from a brain coral. And as I explained, corals are part calcium carbonate like our bones. If you think a coral grows maybe one or two centimeters a year, this coral core you can see in the bottom is about 50 centimeters long. Now a coral grows one to two centimeters a year, so I've probably got 30 to 50 years of growth data there. I can put my coral in an x-ray, the same kind of x-ray you would use as a human, and I can document annual growth bands because like trees, corals put down annual growth bands. So I can see how fast a coral is growing. But what a coral also does is it grows in one spot. So whatever is in the water at the time of growth, that is included in the coral's skeleton as a chemical signature. So I can document pollution in my coral cores, changing temperature. And what this study showed me from Tobago and the Caribbean is that at periods when it got really, really hot, the coral stopped growing. And this is what you can see, these little red stars and these white bars and these x-rays. That shows you when the coral stopped growing during bleaching events. But what was really interesting is I took coral cores from all around the island and the corals that bleached were at the most polluted sites. And the corals that didn't bleach were at the most clean water sites. So they didn't have sewage runoff. They didn't have nutrient runoff. So this tells you there's a lot of different things happening to corals at the same time, but clean water can really help them and survive these environmental stresses. So what happens after bleaching? Well, what you can see here on the left is you can see a bleached coral. Often a coral initially appears to recover, but six months down the line, it gets disease. So like humans, if we're ill, we become more susceptible to future illnesses. Corals are after all animals. The bottom right hand image shows you a baby coral, a juvenile coral, and that's probably about five millimeters big. And what this graph shows you is we have counted hundreds of baby corals on the reef. And we have documented when bleaching and storms occur. And what we find is in the year following a climate change event, a storm, a cyclone, a hurricane, coral recruitment drops. So there's less baby corals on the reef. So less future generations. So there's a knock-on effect going into the future. What you can see here is a traffic light system. So you can either get recovery following the green arrow to a healthy reef. You can either get a phase shift, which is when there's so many nutrients in the water, the algae, the fleshy green algae can outcompete the slow growing coral and fleshy green algae takes over the reef and we get algal reefs and then we lose all the biodiversity associated with our coral reefs. Or in really extreme events, we just get a dead reef 
And this is typically what we see in really degraded, overfished, polluted waters, the complete loss of a reef. Thank you.